you again for the opportunity of coming together to study your word, to inculcate it into our hearts so that our minds can dwell upon it, can meditate upon your words, and that it can be useful to us in the days to come. We pray that you would anoint our understanding, anoint our hearing, anoint these lips that speak the words of truth from your word today. We pray that you would touch those that are sick in body. Thank you for uh, touching my body and uh, bringing me to uh, class tonight. Thank you for the opportunity to share your word. To me, Lord, it is exciting and I enjoy uh, studying your word and I pray that others enjoy it as much as I do. Now, Lord, go with us into this class for the next hour and we'll give you praise and glory in the name of Jesus and just say amen, amen. and amen. Now, we are continuing with our study of the redeemed heart and um, we began by uh, introducing a uh, branch of systematic theology called uh, sortology and this is just simply the study of sin and the redemptive process there is much more to it than that but that gives you uh, the highlight take time to go back and review your uh, notes also note that there are a number of other um, doctrine that are associated with this branch of systematic theology and we have covered uh, a, a good number of those as we go. We opened um, with a study of uh, Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. And in that verse, we uh, saw three great truths that uh, God uh, presented to us and that we need to um, become aware of. The first one was the existence of the uh, Trinitarian God or the Triune God or God in three persons uh, or the study of the Trinity, whichever one of those you want to, uh, to choose. Um, we uh, had quite a bit to, to uh, say about that and I'm not going to go into all the detail that covers that particular topic. We also take note of the second um, uh, great truth deals with the Creator uh, God um, that created everything out of nothing. Um, God is the only entity and being and uh, uh, process, I don't I hate to use the word process, but um, great mind that has always been and he will always be. Uh, he was before this universe. He was before this cosmos, um, and we uh, have spent time talking about uh, that very thing uh, in this lesson. We also take note that the third uh, great truth is that the material universe had a beginning. The material universe had a beginning. Um, at some point in the dateless past, God stepped out into nothing and said, let there be. And there was. And um, we have uh, dealt with that uh, quite uh, some time. And then in section two of our uh, study, we dealt with uh, a divine actuality. And that divine actuality is that God exists. There will be those uh, individuals that will try to tell you that there uh, is no such thing as God. But uh, uh, in our thinking um, that in, in God's word, God exists. Not only do we find that God exists in written format and in, in the word of God itself, but we know that God exists because he lives within us. Mm -hmm. he, he speaks to us. He um, is with us daily. And um, we take note that he exists in three distinct personalities, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And so um, we spent a great length of time studying uh, just the fact that God uh, uh, exists or God's existence. Um, we dealt with scriptures and uh, so forth. 
uh, for example, the Ten Commandments and the teachings in Isaiah and the teachings of David. Um, and we see uh, in John 4, excuse me, in John 5, uh, verse, uh, verse 44, uh, it uh, very definitely uh, proclaims and lets us know that uh, our God exists and, and the New Testament um, uh, supports that, uh, uh, that, that fact. Notice the existence of God, as far as I'm concerned, is a fact. It is not a theory. Mm -hmm. You understand what a theory and a fact is? A fact is something that can be proven. And we can prove God exists. You know. uh, a theory is um, a hypothesis that has been set forth that um, says we think that this is, is true, but we cannot prove it. Uh, 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 logic and uh, uh, reasoning and so forth lets it uh, leads us to the conclusion that this is a true statement, but we cannot prove it. In the existence of God, it is not a hypothesis. It is not a theory. It is a uh, fact. It is an actuality. God exists. We went on and talked about um, God's uh, uh, characterist uh, characteristics. Uh, there were four major characteristics that we all um, have come to know. Uh, God is omnipotent, God is omniscient, uh, God is omnipresent, and God is eternal. But there are other characteristics that the Bible shares with us about God, such as God is love, um, and God is caring, and the list goes on and on. And you have uh, a, a, a pretty exhaustive list uh, in your notes. They are not exhaustive, but there is a, a lengthy uh, list of these uh, characteristics uh, about God. He is holy. He is jealous. God is not pleased when you go after other gods. And uh, we take note that since God is the only God, then other gods has to be something that is created by man himself. And we see an example of that very thing with uh, the children of Israel as they came up out of Egypt and while Moses was on the mountain talking uh, with the God. They're down in the valley building their own recognition of a God, a calf God. And uh, uh, it so in angered Moses that he threw the Ten Commandments um, uh, at, uh, at the image and, and the uh, Israelites. And um, we won't go into a lot of long detail, but just know uh, it wasn't a pretty sight. So we, we dealt with God's um, characteristics or, or attributes. We looked at his natural uh, characteristics and attributes. And there was much, much more that we talked about uh, God. But in section three, we dealt with two pre-cosmos decisions applicable to humanity, and that not only were are they uh, uh, are these two decisions applicable to humanity, but they are foundation to God's plan of redemption or the covenant of redemption. The first of these great decisions uh, deals uh, with moral uh, failure. Um, God decided that uh, he was going to create uh, intelligent um, uh, beings. Um, and uh, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, in conference, decided that if we are going to create uh, uh, created beings that are uh, intellectual, they must be given the uh, ability to choose uh, between right and wrong. They must have uh, self-will. They must be able, able to reason for themselves. Um, uh, God said, yes, uh, th this is something that needs uh, to be done if we're going to uh, create intellectual uh, beings, then uh, this is very, 
definitely a major component of their being intellectual. Um, but then the question came up, but what happens if they fail? What happens if they decide to go against the commandments that has been laid out for them uh, to follow? And God, uh, the Father, God, the Son, God, the Holy Spirit, uh, came to the conclusion, we will have to take that risk. And then they began to think, and here's the second um, decision um, that they, uh, they had to make. Um, they decided that if uh, they were going to create rational, intellectual uh, being that has uh, self-will, um, then uh, they had to take the risk of, of their failure. Well, what happens if they fail? So God formulated a plan, and it, it is not uh, named in the Bible as the covenant of, uh, of, rede uh, of redemption, but the um, elements are there, the, uh, uh, the features that would go into a covenant of, uh, of, uh, uh, of redemption is very definitely there. And so uh, they created a plan whereby uh, the fallen creature, intellectual creature, would be able to be restored back to fellowship with God. And we see that both the angels and mankind both was confronted with this uh, situation and both failed. And we take the, uh, we took the opportunity of talking about uh, the creation of uh, angels uh, and uh, how that God created all of the angels at one time. Uh, and they created millions of them at one time. He spoke, they came in uh, to existence uh, ready to serve him. Uh, they were uh, given the opportunity of being in his presence, getting to know him up close and personal. The Bible tells us that Lucifer was a covering cherub, and that meant that uh, he literally... Uh, had residence in God's throne room. He was c the covering cherub over the mercy seat that uh, is in the temple there in God's uh, throne room and all. Uh, and uh, because uh, the angels uh, were up close and personal with God, knew um, uh, what God expected of of them and uh, uh, was living in accordance to uh, what what God planned. When Lucifer, of his own volition, now notice this was not created, and we'll talk about that a little bit later on later. But uh, this was not a creative uh, event by God. It was Lucifer's own volition that he looked around and he began to uh, think within himself, oh, well, I should be able to exalt my throne above the throne of God. I'm, I'm the equal of God. A little bit of power can corrupt people or can corrupt uh, 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 sentient ind individuals. And Lucifer didn't have a little bit of power. He had a lot of power. And uh, he still has a lot of power but he doesn't have the power of God at all. And so uh, he was able to uh, convince a third of the angelic host to follow him in a rebellion against God. And we're going to talk about that more uh, today. But we see that uh, Lucifer and a third of the angels did uh, fall into the trap of uh, moral failure. And... Uh, their uh, reconciliation to God took a different uh, standpoint than what uh, mankind's reconciliation uh, with God does. And we'll talk about that in just a few moments. I, uh, a while, while ago when I was mentioning uh, the covenant of uh, reconciliation, this was uh, uh, put into place pre-cosmos. 
pre-earth, pre-universe, back in the dateless past, um, the, uh, this uh, redemption uh, plan was, pl uh, was, uh, was set in and uh, put into place. We find that this plan has two major elements. And for those of you that are following along quickly, I'm at point 4.3.2 and 4.3, uh, let's see, 4.3.2.1 and 4.3.2.2. There are two elements of the uh, uh, covenant of redemption. One is uh, that of mercy and the other is that of grace. Now, we all know that grace uh, is the unmerited uh, love and uh, favor uh, of God. Um, and if you look at uh, 4.3.2, uh, uh, mercy is defined uh, by uh, Marion Webster's dictionary as an act of compassion, uh, pity, uh, lenient, and forgiveness motivated by familial affection. This level of uh, mercy is observed uh, in King Solomon's famous judgment of the two uh, women uh, who claimed the same uh, child. And uh, when Solomon decided to um, uh, give his famous judgment and divide the child in half, the true mother was willing to give up that child um, uh, so that it could live. And so we see here that this is an, was an example of God's uh, mercy as well. God exhibited this same level of mercy towards sinful uh, humanity, according to Jeremiah 31, uh, 20, Psalms 103, verse 13, and Isaiah 63, um, 15 through uh, 16. Now again, grace is defined as the undeserved, unmerited acceptance and love uh, um, received from another. In, in this case of um, uh, the uh, covenant of redemption, the one that is going to be extending the grace is God. His love goes way beyond anything that we as human beings can uh, comprehend and uh, understand. Uh, if you read John 3.16, it uh, tells you very clearly, for God so loved the world. That word love is agape, and it is God's love. It is not human love. Uh, we as uh, human rational beings, uh, we understand what we mean by love, but it is difficult for us to understand God's love. And God's love extends to the bonds where that even though we turned against God, we rebelled against God, we hurt God, and the list goes on, he was willing to forgive us. And the forgiveness came on God's part, but it also means that we have to receive the forgiveness as well. Just because God is saying, here is my Forgiveness doesn't mean that we are forgiven. We've got to receive God's forgiveness. We, we ask God to forgive us and to, to come into our heart uh, and, and to live there. So I wanted to make sure that we understood the uh, uh, two bases of uh, the covenant of reconciliation, that of, of uh, mercy uh, and that of uh, uh, grace. Then in uh, chapter 4, we dealt with God the Creator. And we uh, take note that there are uh, three distinct things that God created. Okay? And um, when we get into this, remember Genesis 1.1? 1, 1? It reads, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. That's one way to read it. In other modern English translations, it is read, heavens 
and earth. And immediately when we uh, get into this, this study, we are confronted with a mystery. Why does part of the uh, modern e uh, English translations of the Bible uh, use a singular and, and the other uh, part uses a, uh, a plural? Well, it all has to do with the Hebrew word has mayim, uh, M-A-Y-I-M, H-A-S-H-M-A-Y-I-M. Um, this word, the first part of it, the H-A-S, uh, that is, it, it, it's a co uh, co uh, compound word. We'll put it this way. It's a compound word. The first part of it, the H-A-S, um, is, or excuse me, the H-A, is one word. And that word is the, T-H-E, the. And then the Shemayim is the uh, part that is the second one where that uh, we get the uh, terminology of heavens. Heavens. Now, when we use the uh, H-A in front of this uh, word, in, in this compound word, we take note that it is talking about all of the heavenly components. All of the heavenly components. Everybody understand that? Not just not just one or, or two or, or so forth. But we take note that um, uh, the heavens includes God's heaven. And by the way, are you aware that there is a special place in heaven that is referred to as the highest of heavens? That's God's heaven. That's where God lives. That's where Jesus went to build the place that we are going to go to when, when he calls us home. Many people was not aware that there was that division. And uh, uh, in one of the renderings uh, of, of Scripture, it talks about um, this uh, place of God being in the north of heaven. And so, uh, but it, it is separate from all of the other things that are going on in his heaven that he, that he rules over. It would be like... Um, if you go to if you go to uh, uh, Europe, uh, go to England, and go to London, and you know that the British government is a constitutional monarchy, it means that uh, there is a, a royal head, whether it be a, a queen or a king, but the governmental part is ruled over by Parliament. Okay, but when it comes to the royalty, they have special places that they live, and you don't get into those places easily. And from Buckingham Palace, Queen Elizabeth oversees, or did, oversee uh, uh, her vast empire. Now, instead of be, being Buckingham Palace, it's Windsor Castle, uh, where she is uh, now. But wherever she is, that is considered to be royal ground. With God, the north of, uh, part of heaven is where God oversees all that is included in the creation of heaven. Okay? Um, now... Uh, if you look at uh, 6.2.1, I give you an explanation uh, here of the uh, ha shem there, There's actually three words uh, here. You have the H-A for the Hoss. And uh, by the way, you can use this either as a noun or as uh, a verb. Uh, but we take note that the H-A... Uh, 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 is considered one word, the. 
and then we have the S H A M A Y Shemaiah, and uh, that word deals with heaven, and then you have within Shemaiah a, another word Yim Y I M means water. And it is interesting that uh, in uh, the recreation of the earth, notice that God divided the water and formed the firmament. So this word yim has reference to the firmament as well as a part of of the atmosphere, which is a part of the earthly um, uh, heaven. Okay. Um, now, uh, uh, one one other thing before before we move on. Um, this uh, phrase, heaven and earth. The heavens uh, are the heaven and uh, the earth. This is called a murism. A murism. And if you will look at 6.3, uh, uh, you will see uh, that, defi that definition uh, there. Uh, it seems that Genesis 1.1 speaks about the original formation of the heavens and the earth uh, as being in creative stages. It presents heaven in its initial but not finished uh, view that came directly uh, from God's creative hands. We do not see God's final creative work until much later in chapter 1. And that's dealing with uh, the uh, 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 restoration uh, there. Uh, but in 6.2.2, um, this uh, word uh, or th this uh, grammatical um, thought of mirrorism uh, is presented when it's talking about the heaven and uh, the earth. Um, it is view, uh, this is a figure of speech where two words or ideas are linked together to mean something more than the sum of its part. Okay? So uh, this mirrorism here, when we talk about the heaven, we are not only talking about God's heaven, but we're also talking about the heaven that is uh, the uh, what we would call outer space, where um, uh, solar systems and galaxies and uh, universes and uh, cosmoses and and so forth uh, come in, into being, and then that area around the Earth that uh, uh, we re refer to the uh, as the firmament. Um, but it's that uh, uh, area of oxygen and nitrogen that we can breathe. Um, they are still trying to find another planet that meets that characteristic. And so far they haven't been exactly um, successful. They, so they claim that they've come close, but they, but they haven't uh, become that successful. Okay, now... So we, uh, we talked about God's first creation, heaven. Then we talk, uh, and mentioned uh, the creation of angels. And um, in uh, this part, I alluded to the fact already that uh, God created all the angels at one time. And if you will um, look in your uh, notes, you will find that um, there are a number of functions that uh, the angels uh, perform uh, for God. Um, we take note that they praise God. They worship and they glorify God. They rejoice in what God does. They serve God in whatever capacity is needed. If God needs an angel to go and do a particular thing, they go and, and they, uh, they do it. Um, they are spiritual uh, beings. Okay? They are spiritual uh, beings. Uh, at a thought, they can be in, in, in a different place. 
uh, they uh, communicate revelations from God. They, uh, for example, uh, uh, I went through and I looked at a, a, a long list of, of the various angel uh, interactions with, with humanity. And, and I noted, uh, uh, for example, um, Balaam came across uh, an angel of, of the Lord. And the angel of the Lord was trying to get across to uh, Balaam. And finally, the donkey had to speak for him. Uh, in the New Testament, you have uh, angels coming to Elizabeth, who is a relative of Mary, the mother of Jesus. In fact, it is believed that actually uh, Jesus and John the Baptist were actually cousins. Uh, now, you have to be careful with that word cousins uh, in, uh, uh, in the New Testament because uh, just close friends were referred to as cousins, okay? So uh, you have cousins and then you have cousins, okay? So uh, in this case, uh, uh, we believe that uh, John the Baptist and Jesus were actually blood cousins, uh, but we find where that um, uh, Elizabeth uh, uh, and her husband, uh, Zacharias, uh, was uh, confronted by an angel and said, hey, uh, y'all are going to become parents, and you're going to be the parents of John the Baptist. And then we have an angel of the Lord coming, the same angel, Gabriel, coming to Mary and giving her the same message that you're going to be the mother of, of the Christ. And, also, uh, and and uh, in your um, appendix, I think I listed a number of these uh, uh, visitations uh, uh, in in that in that particular uh, 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 appendage. Okay, so take note that. Um, uh, they communicate revelations from God uh, to mankind. They carry out God's judgment. They carry out God's judgment against a person or a city or a people group. Probably the best known of, of an angel bringing destruction uh, uh, in, in compliance with God's judgment was um, with uh, the angels of the the angel of the lord whom we believe was actually jesus christ and two other angels and the other two angels went on to um sodom and then the uh, sister uh, city uh, uh gomera uh, sodom and gomorrah um, and there these angels destroyed both of those cities how do we know that because lot was Dwaddling, not hurrying out of out of out of the uh, the city, and then uh, also he said, you know, uh, if we are left out here in the uh, the the open, we're going to get caught in the fallout. We need to go to another place. And the angel says, okay, go ahead to this place that you've identified. And they are, are dwaddling, and the angel tells Lot. You need to hurry up because we cannot destroy Sodom and Gomorrah until you're taken care of. Now that's from the commentary of Bartley, so that that you can uh, uh, get that uh, get that a little understanding. Okay, not only uh, does uh, uh, angels carry out God's judgments against a people, a uh, uh, city, or a uh, people group, um, they appear before God. In the book of Job, they appeared before uh, God. And notice who came with them. Lucifer came with him. It doesn't identify him as Lucifer, but, but it, uh, uh, does, uh, uh, it does allude to the fact that it is him. And notice he is not coming as an angel of evil. He's coming as a defense attorney and and here uh, Lucifer is approaching God and he's saying um, you see your friend there Job and he begins to 
to accuse Job and accuse God for protecting Job and saying, if you will keep your hands off of him, he will curse you. And so he is approaching God as, quote, unquote, uh, as a, a defense attorney. And uh, I don't have time to go over that uh, 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 anymore. Okay, then we come to uh, uh, the creation of the earth. The creation of the earth. When was the earth actually created? It was created when heaven was created. Okay? What the original earth looks like, we don't know. The Bible does not give us uh, that uh, uh, information. Um, go to um, 8.1. And um, we, uh, we take note that uh, within God's awesome uh, creation of, of, of the heavens, he also created here the earth. Um, and uh, the Bible does not describe the appearance of the earth uh, in its original form. That is what it originally looked like. But Lucifer, it, it's noticed that Lucifer is mentioned as being on God's holy mountain. Ezekiel 28 uh, verse 13 from the ESV reads, You were in Eden, E-D-E-N. You were within Eden, the garden of God. Now whether this Garden of God and the Garden of Eden of Adam and Eve are the same thing. We do not know, but they do have similar uh, names here. Uh, and then he goes on to say, every precious stone was your covering. Uh, sardis, uh, topaz, and diamonds, and beryls, and onyx, and jasper, and sapphire, and emeralds, and uh, carbuncle, and, um, and crafted in gold were your settings and uh, your uh, engravings. Um, Lucifer was wearing, uh, I guess that, that would be a good enough phrase to use here, was wearing all of, uh, of these uh, magnificent uh, jewels in the garden, uh, God's Garden of Eden. Um, we take note though, it says, on the day that you were created, they were prepared. They were prepared. And then uh, you go on down into verse 14, uh, and uh, it does mention that Lucifer was on the holy mountain of God. You walked in the midst of the stones of fire, in the midst of the stones of fire. Now, uh, Isaiah 45, 18 goes on uh, to say uh, it was God himself that formed the earth and made it. He had established it. He created it not in vain. He formed it uh, to be inhabited. Everybody, everybody take note of this. This is talking about the original earth. It, the original earth was created to be inhabited. Who was the inhabitants of the earth? We do not have a clear understanding of that. But Whoever the inhabitants of the earth uh, were, they sided with Lucifer in his rebellion against God. And when this happened, it threw the earth into chaos. Okay? Um, but, uh, and, and we're going to talk about that uh, in, in ju just a moment. Uh, notice that uh it talks about that, that the earth was not created uh, in vain. It was uh, created to be uh, inhabited. Uh, in uh, 8.1.2.1, it brings out the above quoted passage of scripture. It deserves a closer examination. The English Bible. Now, I'm very careful to let you know if I am taking information from the English Bible or if I am taking it from uh, a Jewish Bible or if I'm taking it from uh, the, the Greek uh, 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 Old Testament, the Septuagint, or, uh, or, or even an, over, uh, an older uh, cortex. I try to make sure that, that you understand the, the English version is the most modern versions uh, that we have. But the English Bible's 
many translations renders it uh, uh, in uh, several different ways. The word vain is the same word translated empty in Job 26.7, waste in Deuteronomy 32.10, and confusion in Isaiah 24.10. In other words, um, here Moses is writing and he is saying that the earth was not created to manifest these uh, features. It, uh, it was not a wasteland. It was not uh, created empty. It was not uh, created uh, uh, just as a play toy. Uh, there, there, was, um, uh, there was reasoning uh, for its uh, creation. The word vain comes from the same root word which is translated without form in Genesis 1, 2, and Jeremiah 4, verse 23. Now, uh, take note that these passages that I just brought to your attention uh, refer directly to the state of the earth at one time. At one time, the earth was not created in vain. It was not an empty place. It was not a wasteland. Um, it was a place of vibrant activity. And evidently there was um, some sentient form that uh, was here upon the earth at that particular time. And I'm sure that some of the angels uh, came and visited uh, the earth, but, the, but it talks about the inhabitants of the earth uh, as well. Now, I've alluded to the fact that Lucifer came to a point in his life where that pride began to build up in his life. He began to think that he was more powerful than God, that, uh, hey, I can do what God does. In fact, I can do it better. I mean, that, that was his thinking. Uh, and um, he was able to convince a third of the angels to follow him in this rebellion. And I've had people to question, well, why would these angels follow Lucifer when he was making uh, these um, uh, statements that, that uh, uh, he was just as, as intelligent, just as mighty as God was, and that, that he should actually be on the throne? Why would they agree to that? Well, let me give you this re response. Why did so many people follow Hitler? Mm -hmm. In, in the 1930s. That charisma. Yeah. That charisma that, that is there. And Lucifer had and still has that charisma. Yeah. And that's one reason why you need to be very, very careful when the enemy comes sniffing around your doorsteps. Because he will come as an angel of light he will come as uh, in the disguise uh, of, of a sheep. But the Bible says a sheep in wolf's, uh, in wolf's clothing. But he is capable of making people to understand he even, uh, uh, and you're going uh, it is believed, I, I'll put it this way, it is believed that um, Satan was able to convince Eve that God really didn't want them to be as smart as he was. And uh, we'll talk about that uh, a, a little bit later on. Okay, now, uh, so we, we find that when this rebellion came and we see that when God, and, and notice the Bible says that there was not room in heaven for Lucifer. Therefore, 
he was cast down. There was not room in heaven. In other words, God and Lucifer couldn't occupy the same place. In fact, Jesus uh, in, in his teaching uh, even alludes uh, similar to that in our own lives that, that evil and godliness cannot occupy the same being. Okay? And also, um, we find that there in the history that we've been talking about, uh, and uh, basically I've been giving you a, a, a historical, a biblical historical background, we find that there is a break in this narration between Genesis 1 and 1 and Genesis 1 and 2, there is a break. And we find that that break, in my opinion, understand that in my opinion, came when Lucifer rebelled against God and failed morally and God cast him down. And there was such turmoil now, some people have asked, well, did Lucifer's rebellion and the third of the angels uh, rebelling against God, how did God feel about this? God was upset. God, was, God, was, God felt betrayed. And notice, one of the attributes, he has feelings. God has feelings. And so when we fail God, how do you think he feels? He definitely feels hurt. And, um, but does he allow that hurt to stand in the way of our rebirth? No. Because God is full of mercy and full of grace. And he extends it to us. But I, I want you to just be aware that in the, in the book of Genesis, between the first verse and the second verse, there in chapter 1, there is a break. And we don't know how long that break lasts. And we note that uh, water covered the earth. The firmament fell down upon the earth and, and, and uh, flooded the earth. It was filled with water. Uh, when we get into uh, the rebirth, and notice how I'm using that uh, uh, phrase, the rebirth of the earth, uh, a little bit later on, we'll talk about uh, uh, that, that particular phase. But, I want you to notice that in uh, 8.2.1 um, that uh, pride brings chaos upon the earth. In Ezekiel um, 28 verses 1 through 12, God reveals the rise and the fall of the king of Tyre. He was filled with pride and ambition Elements of megalomania, these are two uh, elements of uh, megalomania, that is the obsession with the exercise of power, especially in the domination of others. Satan wanted to dominate others. He still wants to dominate others. He, he uh, felt that he was uh, so strong and, and had so much power that he was able even to dominate God himself. But he found out differently there. Now, when we go to Ezekiel uh, 28 and also Isaiah 14 verses uh, 12 through 17, we actually are looking at a metaphor here. We're looking at a metaphor um, many uh, Bible scholars believe that this passage of Scripture uh, is metaphorical in nature. Uh, as the king of Tyre, story is very similar, even symbolic, 
to that of Lucifer, uh, of Lucifer's rise and fall from heaven. Lucifer's rise and fall is only found in those two particular passages of Scripture. We've, uh, uh, Isaiah 14, 12 through, uh, well, in detail. Uh, we do have a um, uh, passage of Scripture, uh, I believe it's in Luke, where that it talks about, and uh, Jesus talks about seeing Lucifer cast out of heaven, seeing him falling, falling from heaven. But it doesn't go into the, the who's and why's of, uh, of his fall in heaven. So uh, Isaiah 14, 12 through 17, uh, Ezekiel 28, verses 11 through 19 is the major scriptures that deal with this metaphorical story. In Isaiah 14, uh, 13a, uh, it, this reinforces this hypothesis that Lucifer rebels against God. Uh, Isaiah wrote, you said in your heart, And notice that this is the Holy Spirit speaking through Isaiah. Okay? He's not talking about Isaiah. But Isaiah is talking about Lucifer. You said in your heart, I will ascend to the heavens. I will raise my throne above the stars of God. The stars of God is talking about the angels. I will sit enthroned on the mount of assembly. That is, the, that is where God's throne room is located. Uh, on the utmost heights of Mount Zephorm. We also take note from the oldest book of the Bible, which is Job. Where that, uh, it, it says, where, uh, where were you? When I laid the earth's foundation. Lucifer, just where were you when I laid the earth's foundation? You weren't even created. Where were you when I laid the earth's foundation? Tell me if you understand. Well, Lucifer knew that. He, 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 uh, he, he knew it. Who marked off its dimensions? Surely you know who stretched a measuring line across it. On what were its footings set? Or who laid its cornerstone? While the morning stars, angels, while the morning stars sang together and all the angels shouted for joy. The angels shouted for joy. The sons of God, the angels, the sons of God were part of God's original creation. And so we see where that Lucifer in his egotism, in his megalomania, wanted to dominate, lord it over God and all of God's creation. But God showed him that he did not have that authority. He did not have that power. And so we see that earth is plunged into chaos. Um, we uh, don't know how long the uh, condition lasts, but God decided to re, uh, uh, decided to resurrect uh, the earth from its chaotic condition. And we're going to see this in Genesis 1 and Genesis 2. Um, but take note that just as sinful man must be reborn, according to John 3, 7, so did the chaotic earth. That which is confusion, that which is... Um, uh, disorder uh, that which is chaotic it has to be reborn so the earth that was chaotic the earth that was uh, in, in a state of disorder 
the earth that was in ruin. God spoke and brought rebirth back to uh, back to it. Okay, um, uh, everybody on the same page with me now. We all we all uh, grasp what I've been uh, trying to uh, to get across to you. Okay. Um, Next, uh, next is section eight, and this deals with Lucifer. I decided that um, since we had been talking about Lucifer, that I may as well go ahead and give you the rest of the uh, barrel about Lucifer. And so uh, we're going we're, uh, to talk about Lucifer and the origin of sin. Lucifer and the origin of sin. So in uh, 9.0, uh, sin uh, is going to be the main topic here. And we see that a simple definition of sin is uh, simply the falling short of God's standards. Falling short of God's standards. Sin is a failure to completely fulfill or obey God's commandments and live in accordance to his glory. Romans 3.23. Now this is taken from uh, Romans uh, 3.23. It's taken here from the NIV. But the King James Version uh, tells us again. Anyone quote uh, Romans 3.23 from the King James Version? Come on. That's a, ma that, that's a major scripture. What? For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. That's not Romans 3.23, that's Romans 6.23. Romans 3.23 tells us, um, <laughs> now you got me. <laughs> just, I mean, just went right out of my head. Okay. <laughs> um, you have two verses that are linked together, Romans 6.23 and Romans 3.23. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus. Okay, um, I, don't, uh, I didn't bring my uh, Bible with me, but... Um, I want you to go back and look at Romans 3.23 in the King James Version as well as the NIV. Um, do, uh, uh, do, do, you, do most of you have NIV? You can get it on our... Uh, you got it on, you can get it on phone. But there is another good translation, English translation, and that's the ESV. The ESV. Uh, the uh, English uh, Version. Uh, English uh, Standard Version. Yeah, uh, uh, and the, uh, those are the three versions that I normally go to, but I, I will tell you I have um, a uh, host of Bibles. I have probably about 60 uh, different uh, English versions of the Bible uh, in, in, my, in my computer. And so whenever I say that I do a uh, exegetical uh, study and I uh, uh, look at all of the versions I, I have, uh, you know that I'm looking at a lot of versions um, there. Okay. All right. So we're going we're gonna to stop there uh, at, uh, at Section 8, and um, we will uh, look at that more closely. Do you understand that the reason why that, that I have gone into what, what I have um, dealing with the existence of God, dealing with uh, the creation of, of the heavens and the earth and, and uh, uh, the creation of angels and so forth. You've got to set the stage for man's redemption. And you've got to uh, know that you've got to know, know in detail more about the covenant of redemption. I've only scratched the surface when it comes to the covenant of of uh, of uh, of redemption. 
at all. Father God, thank you so much for your word tonight. Thank you for opening our understanding and helping us to glean uh, the truths that you have uh, for us from uh, this word. I pray that you would be with us uh, these coming days. Bring us again Sunday into your house to worship you in spirit uh, and in truth. We pray for those that are sick in body that your healing would go forth and uh, bring complete health um, and uh, revitalization into their lives. Uh, give them new strength that they may be about your business. Bring us all together, Lord, this coming Sunday that we may worship you in spirit and in truth. And we'll just give you glory and praise and say thank you in the name of Jesus. And we say amen and amen.